have you ever thought about what it might feel like to be in space, to look down on the Earth and see its natural curve, its glow? Take a moment to put yourself there. Now imagine a world in which there are airports dedicated to space travel, where you can book your ticket online, and where you don't need to be any more qualified to go to space than you do to jump on an airplane and travel across the country. Imagine annual family vacations up in orbit or on the moon. If you want to go to space these days, you've only really got two options. The first is to become an astronaut like these guys, and you're going to need at least a master's degree in science or engineering and years of experience in your field. You then have to compete in an extremely competitive astronaut selection process, after which you'll undergo one to two years of training, and then maybe you'll get to sent to space. And hopefully you don't have high blood pressure or uncorrectable poor vision, otherwise, I'm sorry, they won't take you. Does that sound harsh? Well, it's not really. I mean, NASA has to be selective. Astronauts are investments, and they need to remain productive and stay physically fit and healthy in really demanding conditions for months on end. But becoming an astronaut for most of us is a non-starter. The second option is to buy a ticket on an upcoming commercial space flight. Justin Bieber, Katy Perry, and Tom Hanks have already bought their tickets, and Lady Gaga is actually set to perform live in space. However, these aren't really going to establish human space presence beyond short joyrides. And unfortunately, tickets run at a quarter of a million dollars a piece. So, yeah. So unless you absolutely love science and are willing to dedicate about 10 years towards becoming an astronaut, or you're mega rich and can pay for one of these tickets, the options aren't looking so good right now. When I was 16, I fell in love with the, the idea of becoming an astronaut because I do like science, I like it a lot, and this is a view I wanted to wake up to every morning. I've kept this goal in the back of my mind since then, and it has influenced all the big decisions in my life. When I was 18, I moved from Australia, where all my family lives, to Boston, because I was given the incredible opportunity to study and conduct research at Harvard in the Center for Astrophysics. I now study meteorites and how they inform our understanding of asteroids. And through this work, my perspective has changed a little bit. I still want to go to space, in fact, more than ever, but I don't think just going for me is enough anymore. I think we should all be able to go to space. I want to be able to take my mom and my sister and my best friend and show them why I care about it. And I found my answer in asteroids. We are on the cusp of being able to mine asteroids. That is, sending machines into space to collect resources. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. When people find out that I study space science, they get excited, and I do too, and I often get questions like, what is dark energy, and what's in a black hole, and consistently, do you believe in aliens? <sighs> space is a mystery and an adventure. It's awe-inspiring and captivating. Beyond that, space unites us. During the Apollo mission, millions of people across the world tuned in to watch the first grainy images of man walk on the moon. Venturing into space to work and explore is the natural next step for the human race. And not too far from now, within about 30 years, asteroid mining technology will be able to bring thousands of us there. So what is asteroid mining? And how's it going to help us? The concept is actually pretty simple. Asteroids are like floating mountains in space full of valuable resources that we can extract. These profitable resources incentivize the development of infrastructure and transport in the nearby solar system. And with this infrastructure in place, human space travel becomes easier and cheaper too. Unfortunately, we don't really have anything set up to collect them yet. So, uh, these are some asteroids, four of the largest known ones actually, and I, I found a picture of them up against the US to give you a sense of their size. 
um, as I mentioned, they're filled with valuable resources that we can collect. And just to give you a sense of how they compare to mining on Earth, we know that when we mine on Earth, we can only go a few kilometers below the surface because that's the way we mine and that's all we can access. And an asteroid of this size with a diameter of about 200 kilometers happens to have volume equal to the total mineable volume of the Earth with just one of them. And for every big one, there are thousands and thousands of smaller ones too. So there are billions of dollars of mineral wealth flying up above our heads all the time, and we don't have any way set up to collect it. But imagine if there was a resource so valuable that we could convince investors to put out all the money necessary to fund a project like this. Well, that resource exists. It's platinum. Most of us know platinum as an expensive jewelry metal, but it's also used in so many other industries. Platinum is uh, an important part of high-precision lab equipment. It is uh, used in fuel cells, and it's a vital part of pollution control devices found in all cars. And guess what? We know that some of these asteroids have platinum densities that are 20 times greater than the richest mines on Earth. So what's a platinum asteroid worth? Let's do some calculations. We'll take a mid-range asteroid, which has a diameter of about a kilometer and a mass of four and a half billion metric tons. If only one millionth of this kind of asteroid was made of platinum, little flex all amongst it, then we would have four and a half million kilograms of platinum. At the current market price of $30,000 per kilogram, that puts us at a total of $130 billion. Awesome. So that's seven times as much as NASA's annual budget with just one asteroid. Imagine what we could do with that kind of funding. But it's not going to be cheap to get to asteroids, right? I mean, the Apollo mission did cost about $130 billion if you want to account for inflation. However, that program consisted of 11 independent manned missions, and it occurred in the 60s and 70s. Since then, our space launch systems and technology in many other sectors have improved drastically. It's also a lot easier to get to the asteroids than it is to the moon, energetically speaking. Because the moon is so big, it exerts a strong gravitational force on nearby objects. And so when we're landing or taking off from the moon, we have to use a lot of fuel, and fuel's expensive. Asteroids don't have this issue because they're much smaller. All things considered, we place current estimates for a complete asteroid mining mission at around five to 10 billion US dollars. Still not cheap, but compared to this, even if the platinum price were to drop 75% with this kind of discovery, we'd still be working with a hefty profit. But wait up, it's still not that easy. Turns out that not all asteroids contain platinum at all. And the ones that do have a wide range of possible concentration values. So before we tell investors to pour billions of dollars into getting us out to the asteroids, we need to develop a system to pinpoint exactly which asteroids have the resources we want. Otherwise, what are we doing? And that's what I work on. <laughs> in order to solve this problem of the future, I want to take you far, far back into the past. This is our solar system as it was four and a half billion years ago. It's beautiful, huh? It's a big disk of, disk of dust with a young sun in the center. And over time, the heaviest elements in this dust accreted to form these massive spheres of about 1,000 kilometers in diameter. And we call those protoplanets because they would go on to form the eight planets that we see today. Radioactive decay of aluminum in the protoplanets produced a lot of heat and melted all the dust into a magma that had a core made predominantly of iron and nickel because the heaviest elements sunk to the center. When these protoplanets interacted, they would merge, and it might have looked something like this, and they became bigger and bigger. But eventually, the radioactive decay stopped, and they began to cool down, solidifying from the outside inwards, forming onion-like layers, each with different concentrations of elements. And so the, the biggest 
protoplanets at the time became the cores of the planets that we see today, and the smaller ones became asteroids. From that time onwards, when they collided, and they still do sometimes, they were hard and they would smash up into lots of different pieces, exposing that metal core. That metal core is what we call metallic asteroids. And when fragments of metallic asteroids come hurtling through the atmosphere onto the ground, we call them iron meteorites. So, iron meteorites and metallic asteroids are one and the same. And we can study the specimens of iron meteorites on Earth in order to gain insight into what's going on in the asteroids. We classify iron meteorites into the groups that represent the different protoplanets they came from, even though we don't actually know where in space they came from. And this is done by studying the concentrations of nickel, gallium, and germanium. An iron meteorite within a specific group has a small range of possible values for platinum concentration. And therefore, if we could classify asteroids in the same way we classify meteorites, we'd be in a pretty good position to figure out what's in the asteroids without actually having to visit them directly. However, asteroids are a long way away, and I'm presenting a lot of problems here. <laughs> and going to them and collecting samples and bringing back them back to Earth is expensive and time-consuming because we have to test out thousands of asteroids. But there is something we can do. As astronomers, we take what we call spectral images of objects in the sky, and from studying their light, we can tell the relative abundance of different elements and compounds in these objects. And the same principle can be applied to asteroids. So if we were to build a space telescope and program it to go visit thousands of different samples of asteroids, then it could continuously send back the data we need, and we could analyze this data and add to our collection of known good targets. However, as I mentioned, the platinum content might be as little as one millionth of the total asteroid. And so even with the best space telescopes and detectors, it's just not realistic to pick up on the platinum itself. So I'm developing correlations between platinum and more abundant but less valuable minerals that we could use to detect and therefore infer the presence and quantity of platinum without having to detect the platinum directly. This step, in my honest opinion, is really vital in these early stages if we want to make this fledgling venture a success. But platinum is really just the beginning. After we've extracted platinum from something like this, we've basically had to shave down millions of tons of iron and nickel. And what is that? Stainless steel. The universe has given us an infinite supply of stainless steel, and it's going to be all these little pieces that we can bag up and put somewhere in space, maybe on Mars or in high Earth orbit, that we could use to create buildings and structures in space, or to create a huge network of solar panels that would allow us to better harness the energy from the sun and hopefully wean us off fossil fuels. But we could also turn to other asteroids, not just the metallic ones, because once we've started getting the profitable materials, we've got a little wiggle room to explore. There are carbonaceous and stony asteroids, too. From studying those kinds of meteorites, we know that they contain minerals that don't exist on Earth due to the extreme conditions they were formed under. And these minerals have unexplored medical and material science applications. <laughs> but there's something even better. There's water billions and billions of liters of water in space. And for people to go to space, we only really need three things. We need food, drink, and protection from powerful cosmic and solar radiation. And water miraculously does all three of these things. We can drink it, we can hydrate dried food, we can grow new food, and we can use thick walls full of water to simulate our atmosphere and provide us with the same amount of radiation protection. So it's pretty convenient that we've got water up there. Water also happens to be able to split into oxygen and hydrogen, and hydrogen is a useful rocket fuel. So you might like to think of asteroids as fuel stations for our rockets. So once we've started collecting platinum, we want to build reserves of water in order to get space ready for people. And once there are a lot of machines up in space, we're going to need to start sending people up there to repair them eventually. And we probably want to also start sending people to start building things with all these resources that we have. 
And alongside those people, we want to start sending support people, such as doctors, botanists, you name it. And so not long after mining platinum, we have our first space settlement. The point here is, asteroid mining is not just about making investors rich. With just one profitable resource in space, we don't just start a business. We start a whole industry that will pave the way towards making space accessible for us. This might sound like sci-fi, but it is no longer outside the realm of possibility. With valuable resources to incentivize and encourage investment, we will be encouraged and we will be given the opportunity to push beyond our boundaries and develop technology with unimaginable applications, as has been demonstrated by NASA time and time again. With more frequent self-funding trips into space, we will develop the infrastructure and transport necessary to make mining more efficient, and in doing so, to make human space transport afford, uh, an accessible reality. With access to space, I hope and believe that we will once and for all see our Earth as it is, something precious, valuable, and fragile. We will lose focus on the borders that separate us and begin to understand our world and its population as on the same team. It will provide us with humbling perspective, exhilarating adventure, and bring us to yet untouched horizons where there is so much to be learned. Thank you.